Well, we say that she decided not to, but in reality, she is carrying out her father's will because she knows that Wotan loves Zygmunt. She has learned to love Zygmunt herself through what she has learned from Wotan. So she, already, she approaches this with a heavy heart to begin with because she knows that in reality, Wotan doesn't really want to kill Zygmunt. But coming from this world of you know, these immortal gods, uh, Brunhilde has never seen love. She's never experienced love. She certainly has never seen it between Wotan and Fricka. Uh, <laughs> that might be an understatement. But um, in any event, it touches something in her, and it is the pivotal moment, I, I believe, and that's maybe because I'm a soprano singing Brunhilde, but that you know, changes the course of the ring cycle. And so she decides from observing this relationship and the, the fact that he is going to pass up seeing Wotan again, he's, he's going to pass up seeing these other fallen heroes and uh, the fair maidens that are promised to him <laughs> uh, for this woman. And even that he would sacrifice her life before going on with Brunhilde and that stirs something in her and she makes the decision to go against her, her father's will. And um, there are you know, horrific circumstances as a result of this decision. Mm -hmm. But it's also part of the beginning of what makes her such a courageous and fantastic uh, character. Pierre? Well, she's, she has known love because the love of, of her father towards her well, and vice true. versa that's is true. very important. That's the major theme of the monologue of the second act. But not a romantic love. It's not a romantic love, right. but it's, it's, it's the, the best love, the most uh, lasting, you know, Depending which is on the, the father bond. you had, of Depending course. on the father, <laughs> but I think in this case it was, it, it is a genuine uh, um, relationship, which is anyway portrayed by Wagner in a very, as a very honest mm -hmm. relationship in the second act. So I think that of course, in the third act, she argues with the, her father. She gives her arguments. He gives his, and in fact, it's uh, what 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 this. I think what the whole ring tries to show is that, may, in spite of the fact that the gods may invent a series of robots or or figures that they think they can manipulate or predict the behavior of, everything from beginning to end, you know, rolls into one failure rolling into the other, rolling into the other, till the end of the ring. And I think that's kind of the main argument that, in a way, I don't think Wagner believes in, in the robot, uh, but he, um, he, he's demonstrating, in fact, the opposite, that he doesn't believe in the robot, that the human beings are flawed, and that, you know, we will never achieve perfection because upstairs or downstairs we are we are prone to the same psychological uh, constrictions and, and, and paradoxes and contradictions. Uh, that's what I, personally, that's how I, I, I've experienced the ring in, uh, as a piece. I've always gone back, to, uh, I've, I've been fascinated for 40 years by the, the myth of the golem, uh, the, the, which is of course a, a medieval Jewish myth from, uh, from and that's the proto-robot. Pro right? yeah, yeah, in a way, the, I've, I've also um, participated in the, in the making of an opera about the golem. I'm really very interested in this theme, and I think I've used it in my, as an inspiration also in, in, in... I mean, the golem is precisely that. It is a, f a failure. It is about, you know, the, 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 the humanity of the Maharal, the rabbi who creates it, and it's about the, flaw, the, the human flaws, both of the creator and the created. And I, I, it's always helped me very much as a kind of uh, uh, compass uh, in, in working on the ring. Also on Parsifal uh, and Lohengrin, which are also about uh, figure, you know, artificial figures that are pseudo-human that are playing a role in the story. 
Um, so I, I think personally that, that uh, the ring is about not, not believing in, in a savior. It's, it's, it's trying to come to terms with the inevitable mistakes we, we make and we are going to make. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's certainly true, isn't it, that the passage that we just saw, her decision, is the contribution she makes to the twilight of the gods. That because she is defying her father, and as a result of that, Wotan admits at the end, in the great duet at the yeah. end, that he is, what does he call himself, an unzeligen evigen, an unhappy immortal. And that, and that now the authority of the gods has now been usurped. Yeah. And it really begins with her decision here. Yes, it may be uh, the best of loves, but it is a very unequal love. Uh, she is, at the beginning of the act, uh, Wotan's uh, will. She, yeah. She's identical with him, really. This is the scene in which she begins to emancipate. This is not the end of her, her, her way, but this is the moment when she begins to emancipate herself from, from him. This is one thing. The other is what you were talking about. This is the moment when she discovers that there is something beyond the Valhalla, that there is a certain w way of being in the world that, does not, that is not available to the gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a great discovery which transforms her from a goddess uh, into a human being. Well, and I think uh, that has to do with limitation and part of what we were talking about uh, before, I think, part of the human experience, but also the experience of love, desire first and love is the experience of limits. I mean, it's always, it's precisely because we die that that we are human. I can't conceive of a humanity without the notion of limit, and I can't conceive, I mean, I, I think all of the, the history of poetry, the history of the novel, and is about, you know, re, is about love, and love is always about the limit. It's always trying to get across the limit. It's the danger of the limit. Uh, even in Tristan and Isolde, in the, in the medieval story, uh, there is always a, a notion of obstacle, and there's a wonderful book called Love in the, Web, in the Western World by Denis de Rougemont, where he explains that, in essence, really, the, the history of Western culture is the history of this obstacle and this this transcendence that is always a flirtation with death, because this flirtation, this coming close, this obsession with death as a sort of, of ecstasy, of, of, of blurring the limits, of eliminating the limit. We want to eliminate the limit, therefore, in this passionate impulse, in this, in the, behind the impulse, the life impulse that there's a desire, there is, there is also, there's a death wish, which is both, the, it, I think, the, 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 the going through the limit, the transgression of the limit is both at the same time. I can't conceive of this. I think what you're saying in terms of her transformation is also her witnessing this limitation, mm -hmm. uh, which she perhaps doesn't know before. Yes. And I, and, and it's so much part of our experience here. It's part of every. It's part of our experiences in terms of defining who we are as humans. But it's part of even of our wanting to, to come out of ourselves, mm -hmm. to come out of the limit ourselves, to meet the limit of somebody else, and perhaps in the dream to transcend this limit, we have this idea of God, that, of, of love, what a lapsus, <laughs> that, that, that can then be resolved in this, in this sort of uh, fantasy of, of, of deathlessness, which in fact can only come to us if we dissolve completely. So there's the, 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 the and dissolution of course, dissolution is ecstasy, but the uh, dissolution only comes if we go, uh, you know, beyond the limit, so it, it always implies the notion of a limit. Well, in, in a, a couple of decades, when we have a pill or an injection you can take that will reverse aging and let you live indefinitely at the age that you choose, we will find that almost everyone on Earth prefers to take this pill than to get old and, and die. Not everyone, but almost everyone, and we will then find there are other limits that we're coming up against. So it's not the case. We surmount many limits that squirrels encounter. However, we've encountered our own limits, which squirrels cannot imagine. And a superhuman AI may not die. An upgrade human may not die. And may be able to, they may not have a limit of seven plus or minus two items in their short-term memory. They may have 
overcome many, many limits that plague us. They may not get sick and old. They may even be able to fuse minds with each other into a single combined mind if, if they want to, rather than communicating by touch and, and language. On the other hand, that doesn't apply. They will beyond, be beyond all limits, right? I mean, the, the general process you describe of finding limits and challenges and then achieving satisfaction by overcoming these challenges. I mean, this isn't... But that's essentially the, the, human, the, the, and what you described strikes me as essentially inhuman. So it would be another kind of world that is diff difficult to conceive of, just as the dog looking at equations of the cosmos or inflationary cosmology can't quite understand it. I'm not sure we're able hey, to completely... Hey, you don't know my dog. Come on. Yeah. <laughs>